say Hagar and Sarah represent the law or, you know, represent our freedom in Christ. It doesn't say any of that. So how did you arrive at that, Paul? Well, that's how Jewish people thought back in that day. He was using the situation in Genesis to illustrate us being a new creation in Christ, being free in the spirit, right? That we are not slaves to sin, but we are born free through Christ. Does that make sense? So, and I say this because as, as we, once we get into Psalms 1, we're going to understand these things a bit more, all right? Uh, the next element is patterns, okay? Uh, in Jewish culture, rep repetition stresses importance. So if something's mentioned in the Bible by the Lord, it's important, right? It's, if it's mentioned twice, it's even more important. If it's mentioned more than once in each testament, then it's especially important. Um, but, let's see, let me see what I put for the slide. So example of patterns in scripture, right? Uh, Daniel talks about the abomination of desolation. Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation as a future event, right? Daniel talked about it referring to uh, Epiphanes, uh, the mad, coming in and s sacrificing a pig in the temple and setting himself up as God. Jesus talks about it as a, as a future event, and Paul does as well. So we have three times in Scripture, uh, or Paul, Paul mentions it, right? He refers to it. Um, so we have three times where this event is mentioned, and that means it's important, right? This event, we need to keep out. We need to keep an eye out for it, because it's going to happen. And, um, you know, if... Uh, you know, with, with Paul, Paul's, when you read uh, 2 Thessalonians, it seems to mention that the rapture happens around this event. So um, I won't get into the debate with that. We can disagree or disagree on that point of Scripture. But I think that's why it's important. <laughs> so, so let's keep going. Another element is multiple meanings in Scripture. So what you'll get a lot from academic circles is that certain passages or that passages in Scripture will only have one meaning. Um, but actually, passages can have more than one meaning, right? So, for example, uh, I'll just take a basics. Thou shalt not murder. What does that mean? Don't kill somebody. Okay. That's it. That's the only meaning it, there is for that, that verse. All right, let's keep moving. Well, wait a minute. What did Jesus say it also meant? He said, if you hate somebody, you murder them. Two meanings, right? Same thing uh, with adultery, right? We all know what adultery means. Jesus said, if you lust after your heart, after a woman or a man in your heart, you've committed adultery. Two meanings, same passage, right? Um, other examples is because this is how the Jewish mind works. Um, the Trinity, right? One and three, three and one, how does that work? That's contradictory. This shouldn't work. It's not logical, right? But in the Jewish mind, it makes perfect sense. Eschatology, there's four views on it, on the end times, right? The first is idealism. Um, idealism says, and this is a more liberal mindset, Revelation teaches us the truths about good and evil, right? But there's no other meaning to it. There's no future meaning. It's just an allegory, right? Futurism, this is probably where we sit, right? Revelation is about the future and the end times. There's historicism. Well, Revelation really is a figure, is, is a, just teaching us about church history. And you'll get this more from the Reform camp Lutherans, and they'll usually take the first three chapters, the first uh, the, the, uh, narrative about the churches. See, it's about church history. And when you look at, when you actually study it, yeah, that's actually what it's saying. Or the, you actually see the, the uh, resemblance between church history and the churches in, Eph in uh, sorry, not Ephesus, but um, in uh, the beginning of Revelation. The fourth is preterism, right? Revelation was about events that took place in the first century, and that's it, right? Nero was the Antichrist. Jesus came back during that time, and I guess I don't know what else we're supposed to be doing then if he already came back, right? Well, which one of these is true? Well, to the Jewish mind, they're all true. And I'm not saying all true at the same time, but 
I can't just say, oh, the Bible is only about the, the end times, right? Futurism, that's what we believe, right, for the most part, and say, that's it. Well, wait a minute. There, idealism, there are some things there. There is a, a battle between good and evil, right? There are things we can learn from it. Uh, historicism, there are things that we can learn about church history through the seven churches, right? Um, preterism, or even, I mean, I would, I would even say, like, with preterism, yeah, Nero was a figure of Antichrist, but so was, uh, so, so was in a sense, Napoleon, the popes, right? Uh, Hitler, uh, Saddam Hussein. And remember, Saddam Hussein died on the same day, right, that, um, that uh, not, not died, but he was captured um, on the, uh, uh, the same day as Haman, yeah. When, I, either, either he was captured or he was... Uh, or uh, Iraq was invaded. I can't remember the exact days, but but it's quite interesting, right? That a man in history from our time that wants to kill the Jews is, you know, basically basically during a, a biblical date, he's brought down to his own destruction, right? So to a Jewish person, all four views are true. There are things to learn from all four views. And see, this is the problem that too many people have with, with um, they, they, they have these pet doctrines which they base on certain verses. For the men's study, we're talking about 1 John. We're talking about um, people that believe that uh, once you're Christian, you never sin no matter what. And they use verses that prove their point. But guess what? There's other verses, sometimes within the same chapter or same book, that would actually disprove their point. Right? So you have to bring things to a balance. Well, which is true? Well, sometimes all of them are true. Right? But that takes studying. Um, so when we're studying scripture, we have to understand that you're reading a passage, and there's sometimes different aspects or different themes in the same passage right? that you can glean from it. And I mean, we've all had this experience, right? We'll read a passage, we'll learn something from it. A year later, you come back to the same passage, and the Lord opens up right? something new for, for you to learn. So, well, okay, so not, not that there's a different meaning for the Trinity, but basically, um, and, and even when, sometimes when you, um, like, if, if you debate Muslims or talk to Muslims about the Trinity, they have a hard time understanding it. Uh, not that there's a different meaning, but how does three, you know, how, do, how, do, how does God, one God in three persons, doesn't really make logical sense to our Western mind, or even... To so like when you're witnessing to a Muslim, does that make sense? Yeah. So how did how is that possible? I thought St. Patrick had the sandal of the tree. Oh, the the clover, yeah, the shamrock, yeah. So yeah, and and uh, I mean you can understand it, but to an unbeliever or that doesn't under doesn't have this mindset, right? Uh, I think the more you study the Bible, the more you're going to have kind of the Jewish mindset, you're going to understand Jewish culture better the more you, you study it. So for us, it's pretty easy to understand these things, but I'm saying for the way the people on the outside of the world, right, when they see these things, or even Muslims, they don't understand. Well, the Trinity, it's three gods, obviously. We're like, no, you don't understand. They're all, they're, they're all powerful. They're all knowing. They're all, you know, but they're one God, right? They have the same power. They're equal, but, but there's three of them. Like, they don't understand that. So then, uh, is that kind of explain it, Alice? Okay. So the next is I want to understand, I wonder, I want to, um, oh yeah, I want to uh, explain when we're studying scripture, connecting word or phrases. Um, and actually, if you want to know the Jewish term, uh, the Midrashic term for it, it's uh, Geshera Seva, that's the Jewish term. Um, like you guys learned about Kava Homer in the, the missions class. You guys forgot already? Uh-oh, it better not be on the test. No, but anyways, basically, this rule, this is a, this is a rule, a hermeneutic rule that uh, Paul would have used and actually does use, and the rabbis in the first century would have used. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain in just a moment. In the Western mind, we tend to connect contexts together. So what I mean by that is... Um, we like to think of uh, subjects or contexts together. So, for instance, Colossians 2, 1 Peter 3, 1 Corinthians 10, and Romans 2, they all mention baptism. 
So all passages are related because they mention baptism in some way, which is true, right? You can learn because they talk about baptism. Uh, you're going to learn something from them. Let's see. Let me see here because this PowerPoint's not working the way it's supposed to. Let's see, Corinthians 10, Romans 2. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so those passages talk about baptism. Therefore, they're all related somehow. Okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's pretty simple, right? Anyone can understand that. That's, that's how the Western mind sees patterns in Scripture or word studies, right? Here's how the Jewish mind looks at patterns. Um, similar words or phrases, uh, phrases are connected together even if, the con even if the passages where those words or phrases occur are seemingly out of context with each other. So, for instance, let, let me just walk into it. For example, taking the baptism example, right? We can read those passages in the New Testament I just mentioned if we want to learn about baptism. But I bet you, if you looked at baptism, where does baptism first show up in Scripture? And the answer is right there. because, Right? With John the Baptist, right? He baptizes where? Okay. So where else do we see Jordan in Scripture? Levites cross the Jordan, right? Naaman, he was a, a, an Assyrian general, was cleansed in the Jordan at the word of, was it Elijah or Elisha? I can't remember. I think it was Elisha. But Elijah and Elisha both crossed the Jordan, right? Uh, shortly, right? Um, after Elijah was raptured. Another example is Paul talks about baptism in the cloud, right? The cloud in Scripture. The cloud in, that the Israelites were baptized as they walked through and the cloud of, of God, right? Led them through the wilderness. Um, Paul talks about that. Elijah talks about what? And, uh, remember what happened when uh, he prayed for rain, when he finally prayed for rain? What did he see? He saw a cloud the size of a man's fist, right? And that cloud grew bigger and bigger, and then rain came, right? If, and then this is a, a study I would want to do, but I haven't done it yet. But I bet you if you checked out all those passages and cross-referenced them with what Paul and and the disciples talk about in the New Testament, you would learn a lot about baptism. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, Levi's crossing the Jordan. It doesn't mention baptism. It has nothing to do with what Paul said. Well, wait a minute. Paul says that Israelites crossing, or that the Israelites being led by the cloud talks about baptism. But if you go read that passage in Exodus, right, well, it doesn't mention baptism. So how did Paul come, up, come with that conclusion? Right, but he was, Huh? The Jewish mindset, yeah. He was looking at he was looking at the cloud, right, or at the water, and he was showing how that was a picture of baptism, right? John the Baptist baptizing in the Jordan. It's no surprise that Naaman, right, was baptized in the Jordan seven times and then was cleansed, right? That's a picture of what baptism does for us, right? He was cured, uh, cured of leprosy. So. This is just an example. So, so if you want to learn about baptism, go study those chapters. So, <laughs> does that make sense to everybody? Okay. This is how the Jewish mindset works. This is how the Jewish mind works, right? The academic sitting in, in a seminary would say, "Wait, no, this is wrong." You know, if I turn in a paper saying that this was about baptism, they would throw it out with an F, right, and say that that's not that's not right. Well, well, then you would have to uh, give Paul an F too because he does the same thing. Right? All right, so we've learned these different terms, right? And uh, now we're going to go on to the study, right? And uh, we're going to focus more on uh, the trees, right? And that's why it's called Tale of Two Trees. We're going to focus more on the trees here in Psalms. All right. So, when, so let's read that passage again just to get it in our minds. So blessed is the man, uh, Psalms 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. 
All right. So who can tell me the plain meaning? So yeah, if you want to be blessed, so yeah. Yeah, don't hang out with bad people. So the righteous man is blessed. The godly man is cursed, right? All right, that's our study for tonight. Let's go home, right? I mean, that's the plainest meaning. Of course, you know, if someone was to give an actual sermon, it would be, you, you could elaborate more, but this is just a simple, plain meaning. Um, but let's go deeper, because I think the, the, the Lord is talking about a lot of things here, right? When you actually look at it, he's talking about trees, water. What is God trying to teach us, right? And that's always, that's always what, when you're reading scripture, that's always what you want to know. What is God actually trying to show us here? And we're going to focus on uh, verse 3. So the deeper meaning, right? Um, let's see what I put here. So here the psalmist is uh, giving us an analogy, right? The godly man is like what? A tree. Planted by water. Exactly. All right? So the analogy there in verse 3 is connected to verse 2. This is what the godly man is like. All right? So, so trees. Let's figure out what trees represent in Scripture. And uh, these analogies are going to come from Scripture, right? I'm not going to be like, the tree represents Facebook and, you know. I mean, there's people that give sermons like that. Like, I'm just going to speak from my heart. And, uh, like, it, the sad thing, it happens a lot more in uh, charismatic circles, um, uh, with the with the guys from the what's it called the New Revival, Todd Bentley, those guys, they'll ramble on and on, and they'll talk for like two hours. And I mean, it sounds great, you know, and sometimes, but really they're not saying anything, right? They're just speaking from their own mind. They're not actually saying scripture. They don't break down scripture like this. Um, so I'm going to teach you guys from scripture. So, anyways, trees, trees in scripture. So what do trees represent in scripture? Let's see here. Uh, someone go to Mark eight twenty four. And that's one thing too. So as you're studying scripture, if if you cannot prove something with another scripture, then you're probably your conclusion is probably incorrect. I have it. Oh, you have it? Go ahead, Dana. Right, so Jesus here heals a blind man, and the blind man says, Jesus heals him, right? But not 100%. He asks, Jesus asks the man, what do you see? And he says, I see men as trees walking. Right? Hmm, interesting. So, okay, so you got men that look like trees. Okay, Sergio, what are you trying to say? Well, let's keep going. Daniel 4, and I won't, um, you guys can read that whole passage or write it down in your notes, because uh, it's the whole, par the whole dream. But, in this dream, Nebuchadnezzar is represented as a giant tree, right? That reached the heavens. It was great. It was powerful. And then it fell, right? And it was just a stump. That's what Nebuchadnezzar represented, a tree. Jeremiah 23.5. Uh, somebody go ahead go there. So in Jeremiah, the Messiah, a man, he's called the righteous branch, right? Part of a tree. Matthew 7, 16, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. Who is he talking about? Who? Well, people, yeah. False teachers in that point, right? That you're going to know people by their fruit, right? A reference to men as trees, Okay. And remember, notice too here, like, Jesus is not explicitly saying, oh, a guy's a tree, you know, false teacher's a tree, and you're going to know him by his rotting fruit hanging off the branches, right? Jesus doesn't say it explicitly like that. But you notice, oh, wait a minute, he's talking about, you know them by their fruit. 
He mentions them as trees. Uh, in Isaiah 61, 3, uh, the people of Israel, they're called oaks of righteousness, right? Another reference to trees. So what did I conclude? I conclude that in Scripture, trees commonly represent men, right? Now, sometimes it's a different man for a different reason. For instance, da- you know, we know like in Daniel and in Jeremiah, one's about Nebuchadnezzar, the other's about Jesus the Messiah, uh, but it's still talking about men, right? You would have to do a different study to figure out the aspects of each of these men. All right, so let's look. So that's what a tree, a tree is, right? A tree represents man. The next is the river of water. Let's see. I'll click the next slide. Let's see if we're the next. Hopefully. Okay, what does water represent in Scripture? Hmm? What? Everlasting life? Eternal life? What did you say, Jeff? I thought it was the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit? Okay, why? Living water, yeah. Well, let's go through Scripture. Uh, Dana, go ahead. Go to uh, Jeremiah 2.13. Uh, Jeff, since you mentioned it, go to uh, John 7. John 7.37. Yeah, uh, Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me and stopped me of living water, which only to themselves fishing, broken fishing that can hold no one. Right. So they've forsaken the fountains of living water, right? They've forsaken the Lord and the fountains, right? So the water is very important to the Lord, right? The Lord is the fountain. But more specifically, uh, go ahead and read. Uh, Jeff? Yep. So, so yeah, uh, Jesus also refers to that, I think John 8, actually, refers to the Spirit as the living water, right? He's the fountain, but the water is the Holy Spirit. In John 4, Jesus also talks to the Samaritan woman about living water, right? But more specifically, it's the Holy Spirit. Whoops, let me go in the slides here. So, conclusions that water represents the Spirit of God in Scripture, right? So, let's, so let's backtrack a little. We've got to go back, right, a little bit. So, the trees represent men. It's planted by the rivers of water, right, which represents the Spirit of God in Scripture, all right, so. Would you say that Jews knew exactly what that meant? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, Jew, yeah, so the Jews understood what Jesus meant. So a lot of times when Jesus would tell a parable and it says the people didn't understand them, but the Jews, meaning the Pharisees, understood them quite clearly, it's because Jesus was using typology like this. And the common people didn't really understand that typology, but the rabbis did. So that's why they understood, right? I used to think, like, oh, Jesus could speak, and, like, he'd use his, like, psychic mind powers, God powers, and, you know, Alice couldn't understand what Jesus was saying, but Rebecca could, right? Because just because that's how he was, because he was God. No, he, Jesus used the hermeneutical principles of that day, and he knew that if he spoke a certain way, to the common people, they wouldn't understand, but he knew that the people in the back, the Pharisees, just stalking him, you know, creeping him out and wanting to figure out how to kill him, they, they knew exactly what he was talking about. So, yes. All right. Ooh, and I think I skipped a slide. Did I? All right, so I think I messed up on my slides. Um, So, oh, no, no, never mind. So, okay, sorry about that. Um, All right, so let's talk about trees a little bit more, right? More specifically, it's going to be the fruit of the trees. So the, the tree brings forth fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither. Now, this is what we're going to use connecting words and phrases, right? Um, 
whose leaf also shall not wither. So, so maybe one of you guys can tell me and see if you guys can, can figure this out. Brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. Where have you seen like those two phrases before in the New Testament? Okay, Revelation. There's another, another. Oh, uh, what, what happened specifically? Yes. So Jesus cursed the fig tree, right? Well, let's go. Let's go ahead and uh, go there. Um, there's. It's actually in Mark, eleven, twelve through fourteen. I'm going to read the one from Matthew twenty-one, uh, Matthew twenty-one, eighteen. So let's all go there real quick. And thank you, Marcella, for letting me use your iPad. Yeah. Well, I was like, oh, I used my phone as a Bible. Then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm doing my slides. All right. So, Matthew 21, 18 through 22. Now, in the morning, as he returned to the city, Jesus, Jesus was hungry. And, being a fig, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Um, and actually, so, actually I probably should have read. So when you read the passage in Mark, Mark tells you that it was the season for figs, um, but it did not have figs on it, all right? Which, once again, brings forth fruit in, in its season, right? But let's get into it. So, so let's compare. So, Let's compare the two trees, right? The tree in Psalms, it's the season for fruit, and it's bearing fruit, right? And it's strong. The tree that Jesus curses, it's a season for figs, but it's not bearing figs. And it withers, right? So a deep c contrast, a stark contrast to the tree in Psalms 1. You guys understand that? Right? Um, this is where I want to say, notice that these two passages are unrelated, right? When it's very po probably when, when Mark and Matthew were both writing this down, you know, about Jesus cursing the fig tree, they did not have Psalms 1 in mind, right? They weren't thinking, well, is this going to be such a cool comparison of the tree, right? The, uh, the psalmist, it uh, might have been David, uh, but the psalmist that wrote Psalms 1, I mean, obviously he had no knowledge of Jesus cursing a fig tree later in life. Um, Contextually, these two passages are unrelated. Does that make sense? Right? Psalms 1 is not talking about Jesus and the fig tree. Jesus is not talking, Matthew and Mark are not talking about the fig tree in Psalms 1. But yet, you notice the relationship already. It's, it's very apparent. Right? And, um, and it's funny, uh, you know, I try not to read commentaries, but I wanted to see what people say about this. And I found one lady that actually found this connection. One, it was a woman. You know, not sorry, ladies. Not saying anything bad about you guys, but sometimes women are more open to the things of the Lord, right, than men are. And all the academic men, oh yes, this is you know, this is a fig tree and this blah blah blah, all this. But this lady found this connection. But the phrasing is similar, so the Lord's trying to teach us something. Okay, that's the Jewish mindset. The phrasing of the wor the wording is very similar, so God's trying to teach us something with it. Remember, everything in Scripture has a purpose. Every, that's when Jesus said not one jot or tittle, not one marking of Scripture will pass away because the Jews believe that every letter, every word, every root of the word had a meaning. So not just, oh, every chapter has a meaning. No, chapters didn't come about until later, right? Until a monk that really had no idea what he was doing because he divides chapters that randomly sometimes, right? Like sometimes you're reading a Right? You, you're reading like a, one of Paul's thoughts, and there's a chapter break in the middle. Like, you know, people don't write like this. You don't. <laughs> but every word or phrase, right, has a meaning. So to understand the tree in Psalms 1, let's look at the tree in Matthew and Mark a little bit closer, right? All right, so leaves and figs. So it was a season for figs, but this tree had leaves but no fruit. What does this mean? It wasn't bearing fruit. Unproductive. 
unproductive. Okay. So the, the fig tree that Jesus cursed, it was unproductive, right? Okay, obviously. Yeah. So how does it connect to Psalms 1? It was hanging out with bad trees. Well, let's look. <laughs> instead, of, instead of coming up with a backstory about the, the tree, and I was a, it was a wee little fig, you know, and I grew up and, and, you know, and hung out with the gangster trees, you know, and later in life we got corrupted, right? Instead of coming up with a backstory, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit off topic, but I went to a Bible study where, where <laughs> You know, this was in Texas, the Bible Belt, the buckle of the, buckle of the Bible Belt, Abilene, right? That's where I used to live. And I went to this uh, college group, and it was basically all denominations together. And this guy came up and taught. He taught of the prostitute that broke the jar of oil at Jesus' feet. And I swear, like, he taught, say he taught for like an hour, 45 minutes was a backstory that he came up with for the prostitute. And I was just like, you know... If you're looking at history and explaining the history of prostitution in those days, okay, I can understand, but like it was some story he made up, and that and that was his whole study basically. But anyways, going back, so yeah, we don't make up backstories about the tree, right? We're gonna see what the scripture tells us about the tree. So what do leaves represent in scripture? Well, Genesis three, verse seven and verse twenty-one. Uh, well, actually, I just gave the answer away. Whoops. But what do, what do Adam and Eve do when they realize that they're naked? They try to cover it with what? Leaves. Leaves. What specifically, though? Leaves. Big leaves. Yeah. So we take that situation, right? What did God do for them instead? Animal, Animal sacrifices, right? And we understand the basics of typology enough to know that sacrifice is a covering for their sin, right? It's a better covering than, right? A fig leaf, fig leaves not going to last you long as clothes. That I don't uh, suggest anyone try it, you know. Um, fig leaves will wear away, right? Works are temporary, but they don't fully cover you up. Animal skins, though, you know, I have a T-shirt. Well, it's got a couple holes in it, but it's probably about 15 years old, and I still wear it, right? Clothes last a long time. Now, of course, you know, so as far as salvation goes, God's going to give us clothes, and those will last forever, right? Um, and slightly off topic, too, but quite interesting, but it's said that it, it's kind of like Jewish, Jewish mythology, I guess you could say, but they said that the clothes that Adam and Eve, that God made for Adam and Eve, had, like, powers. So when people put them on, it's kind of weird stuff. But, yeah, anyways, just... <laughs> But, but, I, but, but that gives you the, at least, like, the Jewish people thought very highly of these, of these clothes. Hitler, okay, Hitler was looking for those? Okay, so that tells you, like, you know, there was something about these clothes. Now, we know better, right? We know better. We know that those clothes represented what Christ had done for us, right? He covered their sin for them. Um, but anyways, sorry, off topic. But the conclusion here, leaves represent good works, right? They tried to cover up their own sin, their own shame on their own, and they couldn't. They represent the things man does to cover his own sin. And uh, also a slight side note as well. Um, Ezekiel 47 and Dana, you, rem uh, you mentioned Revelation 22. I did Ezekiel 47 Yeah. Yep. So... So actually, you could do a study. So that's not wrong at all. But for the purpose of the study, what I came up with, right, I'm, I'm focusing on these fig trees. But the trees in Revelation and, and Ezekiel, it uh, says that the leaves are for the healing of the nations, right? And very interesting, good works, they do heal nations, right? Humanitarian work does. But does that save? No. You know, and that's what's wrong with some of these, um, uh, some of these uh, uh, organizations that go to third world countries to help them out, Right? We'll just go and feed them, you know, give a homeless person a burrito and never tell them the love of Jesus, walk away, and, you know, he might die the next day. It doesn't help his soul, right? So, anyways, that's a side note. So, that's what the leaves represent, right? Good works. And remember, we're connecting this with the tree. So, what about the figs and the fruit?
What does it fruit represent? Favor? Productivity. Productivity. How about in scripture? Go ahead, Dana. Um, okay, yeah. So I would put it this way. Let's see how I put it. Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Right? I think, did I miss one? All right. Well, anyways, um, that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is more, it represents the work of the Spirit in a believer's life. Right? It's the end result. Yes, exactly. Right? It's what the result of a spirit-filled life is. The result of a spirit-filled life. So why did the tree in Matthew not bear fruit? Where was it planted? The one in Matthew, where was it planted? By the path. By the path, yeah. So if a tree... If, I, if you plant a tree in the middle of your yard and never water it, what happens? It dies. It dies, yeah. One tree is by the path, right? What about by the roadside, not by the river, right? So it's a picture of a person living without the Holy Spirit, right? If you're planted by the rivers of water, you're going to bear fruit. You're planted by the roadside, you're not going to bear fruit. Right? right? That's what it represents. So if you consider the soil, then if you put a hard path alongside the road, mm -hmm. and yeah. the river would be softer and easier yeah. to grow. Yeah. Now, if you did your own study, you could compare the soils with the parable of the soils and the seed. Yeah. Right? You could make an even bigger connection. If Steve? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, so in the parable of the soils, the sea is land, right? But the tree in Psalms is planted, yeah. And see, I, I didn't put this down, like, we could, we could discuss this all night and, and just come up with, see what else Scripture has to say. And remember, here's the interesting part. The past, the parable about the soils, does that have anything to do with the fig tree in Matthew? Contextually? No. No, no right? It, it doesn't, but there's still a connection. Right? Or there's even a connection with Psalms. Right? So, so yeah. So that's what figs and uh, the fruit represent. And quite interesting, too. Notice that, you know, there's a reason that in Genesis why they use fig leaves, leaves from a fig tree to cover their themselves, right? And then because we see figs and the we see figs and fig and fig trees all through scripture, right? So so how about this? Who is the fruit for? What does fruit prove? And you got the answer right there, the little cheat sheet, because my slides didn't work. Who was hungry? Jesus. So the fruit, who is it for? Fruit of the Spirit. For Christ. He's gonna prove. He's gonna test your fruit, right? Whether you're bearing any, right? And uh, even talks about the vine and, you know, and the branches he prunes, right? He's, Jesus was the one who inspected the fruit. And there's a lot of um, typology, too, with, uh, 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 of Jesus, the son, and coming back to inspect right, his father's vineyard. You know, it's not trees, but, I mean, um, at least the, being the fruit inspector, it's always Jesus, right? And he's always the one. So what's the conclusion? Fruit represents the work of the Spirit in the life of a believer, right? All right, so let's keep going here. How about withering? Let's see, hopefully it won't give you the cheat sheet. Let's see. All right, well, well it does, but what's the significance of withering? Huh? Dying, death, yeah. Well, if, if we were to read 1 Kings 13, 1 through 7, uh, somebody go to John 15 and Jude 12. Um, 1 Kings 13, 1 through 7, uh, there's a king that comes out against uh, one of the prophets. I can't remember which one. He reaches out his hand and points at him, and his hand <laughs> withers, right? Hmm, okay, interesting. Um, anyone at 1 John? Uh, go ahead, Luis. Bring forth much fruit. So with 
without me, and you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and man gathers, ga and man gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So if you don't abide in uh, in the vine, right? You wither, and then what happens to the vines that wither? They're burned. Uh, who's got Jude 12? Go ahead. Yes. So... Uh, it's talking about false teachers, false prophets, right? Their trees withered, uprooted. What's their end judgment? Well, what's their end? Their end is judgment. They gave the answer away, right? Withering, it's a symbol of judgment, right, in Scripture, right? Go ahead, Dana. How I just thought if when Moses took his hand and it withered it? Well, it, was, it had leprosy on it. It had leprosy, yeah. So there could possibly be a connection there, so... Um, but at least for, for the sake of this study, withering it's a symbol of judgment, right, in Scripture. The tree does not wither, right? All right, so let's, so with all the pieces put together, right, a lot of information, but let's put them all together and let's see what we get, what picture we get, right? And uh, there goes my slide. So let's compare the two trees, right? One's planted by, so the tree is planted, uh, so let's see, I'm trying to think, I don't know if I, if I made this too confusing. So basically, uh, the two trees, one is planted by the river, one is planted by the roadside. The one by the river is the righteous man, right? He has the Holy Spirit, sorry for the typo. Um, the ungodly man does not have the Holy Spirit, right? He's planted by the road, okay? He's not near the living water. One tree bears fruit and leaves, the other does not bear fruit, Right? So the righteous man does good works and is also saved, right? So the tree in Psalms, if you're, if you're that kind of tree, you're saved because you're doing good works because you have trees, or sorry, you have leaves, but you're also bearing fruit. The ungodly man does good works but is not saved, okay? So Mormons, met Mormons that are very nice people. They invited me to their house where I took apart their doctrine and they didn't like it, but <laughs> they were very nice about it. Right? Uh, but they're not saved, right? Um, you know, Ivan, his family, Jehovah's Witness, you know, I'm sure they're nice people. Uh, I've, I've, I have uh, relatives that are Jehovah's Witness, very nice people. Uh, they do good works, they, they take missionary trips. Mormons, very big on missionaries. Uh, a lot of uh, Mormons in Samoa, right? A lot of Samoans are Mormons, and it's because of Mormon missionary work, uh, but they're not saved, right? Um, and, uh, and that was the aspect, sorry, I think I didn't put that in deal, detail enough, but that, that, um, that tree in, uh, in Matthew. Uh, so basically, let me elaborate on that just a little bit. Um, fig trees, they have really big leaves, and the leaves cover the figs so they don't get sunburned, right? So when you see a leaf, that means there's fruit. There should be fruit there, right? But when Jesus went to get the fruit, there was none. It was just the leaves. So it's a useless tree, right? What good is a tree? You know, I mean, uh, an oak or I don't know what other. Well, oaks have acorns, I guess, right, Alice? You know, but I, are there any trees that don't really have fruit? You know, there's some, there's some trees that, that you can't eat the fruit, right? They're, they're, they're there for decoration or they're there to. Right now, they're like an ornamental flower. Yeah, or something like that, right? There's some trees that are ornamental or something. Uh, but this tree is a fig, it has fruit, right? If, like if you see an apple tree, you want to go eat apples off of it, right? You don't grow it just to, oh, look at the pretty leaves, right? That's not really what you grow an apple tree for. You grow it for a purpose. Fig leaves, fig trees grow to produce fruit. Well, that one wasn't, and that's why Jesus cursed it and it, and it withered. So, anyways, um, and also, sorry, a little bit, I know we're in the middle. Well, um, the reason I talked about multiple meanings is because we're getting multiple meanings already just from our, our study, right? Because I'm, I'm focusing on Psalms 1. But if you actually do a study on the fig tree Jesus cursed, it's actually more a representation of the state of Israel during that time. Okay, and that's another meaning, which I'm not focusing on. 
but you know, same passage, multiple meanings. All right, anyways, so the tree does not wither. One, one tree does not wither, the other tree withers, right? The righteous man will not receive judgment. The ungodly man will receive judgment. That's ultimately what happens, right? So then, you know, it's nice to, to learn all of this, right? It's like almost like a little class, and it's great to learn. Oh, the Jewish mind said, oh, multiple meanings. Look at all this stuff. It's great. But if you can't apply it to your life, this doesn't mean anything, right? This is the easy part, right? Uh, and I've explained uh, in the men's study, right, when, when John says, love one another. Oh, great, I learned about love today in class today. Okay, now go, go love your neighbor. Go love the irritating coworker. Go, go love, you know, the, your annoying, unbelieving brother, you know. Oh, great. You know, go love the guy that cuts you off in the middle of the freeway, right? Okay. That's the hard part, right? So the conclusion, what kind of tree are we individually, right? What kind of people are we? Because remember, who's inspecting the tree? Jesus. Yeah, who's inspecting us? Who's the ultimate judge? Yeah, Jesus Christ. You know, are we a tree that stands and bears the fruit of the Spirit, or are we going to be a tree planted by the roadside that withers, right? What tree are we? And who's ultimately going to reveal it, though? Your heart. Who's going to re reveal your heart? Sorry. Jesus, yeah. Remember, the focus here on the study, it's not about the tree. Okay? The tree is there, but a fig tree grows to produce what? Fruit that gets eaten, right? Who's going to eat the fruit? Jesus. Right? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So... We're trees, but we're made, to, we're made for his glory, right? We're made to glorify the Lord. So, like I said, we can know all there is to know about Scripture. We can know all the terms. We can take mission school 100 times over and learn all the big words and academic terms. But if we can't apply it, if we can't apply this, this passage to our lives, right? And, and Mark goes a lot... That's one thing I love about Marco is that he's a lot better at the application part than I am at this. I can explain this to you, you know, but when it comes to practical use, you know, he's a lot better at it. But, but still, you know, um, in our own devotion, in our own walk with the Lord, we have to come to terms with him personally and individually, right? We allow him to change our minds. We allow him to make us more like that tree, right, that's planted by the river. Because if, you know, if you learn all these things, but you have not love, as Paul said, it doesn't matter, right? It's just noise, like Charlie Brown, the trumpet, you know, when an adult speaks, right? It's all just noise. And so, so my prayer is that this not all be noise, but that, it, you know, for me, it's done out of, out of love. Right, to teach you guys what God's word says, but at the same time, when we learn something, we need to apply it out of love, love for others. And to realize, right, that other people, they're trees too. But if they're not bearing fruit, they're gonna wither. God's gonna cast them into fire, right? A, a withered old tree, the only thing it's good for is for firewood. Right? And those things they burn up fast, right? You ever you ever accidentally chop a, a log and it's green and you try to burn it, it doesn't work. <laughs> but, you know, wood that's been withered, wood that's just been out there and it's dry, that stuff burns out quick. So my encouragement is for us to continue to meditate on this word. This psalm says, let's, let's read it one more time. We'll read it one more time together and then we'll pray. My encouragement is that we do what the scripture says here. Uh, let's see here. Sorry. Marcelo's iPad was saying something in Spanish and 
I understand it, but my brain, I haven't read Spanish in so long, my brain's trying to figure out what it says. Um, let's read it one more time. Blessed is the man, let that be us, who walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Quite interesting. Actually, I just figured this out, too. Stands in the path of sinners. Interesting, the other fig tree was by the path, right? I didn't even catch that till just now. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. Lord. We just come before you, Lord, and we ask that you would have us be planted, Lord, by your Spirit, Lord, like the tree, Lord, that you've shown us here, Lord. May we be filled with your Spirit each day, Lord. May we meditate, think about your Word every day and every night, Lord. May we also find joy and delight in it, Lord. Lord, just uh, forgive us, Lord, when we sin against you. We help us continually just turn away from our sin, Lord, and continually repent and turn to you, Lord, to stay steadfast in your word, to study it, Lord, to learn it, to think about it, Lord, and not just for the sake of having more knowledge, Lord, or more words put into our mind, but because we want to let your word change our behavior, Lord, and change our lives, Lord, to be more like you, Lord, to love not just one another here, Lord, which is easy, Lord, most of the time, but to love those outside, Lord, that need you, Lord. And I pray you would help us to be that love and that light into the world as we go out tomorrow, Lord, and continue our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.